We all have a shared ambition, which is actually quite a big ambition, which is really to generate systemic change in the education system. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to working more with you on that. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Jonathan. Um, thank you, Melanie. And just to echo your sentiments, it's fantastic to welcome you all here today. Uh, my name is Jonathan Douglas. I'm director of the National Literacy Trust, um, and we're proud partners of KPMG. Um, and we're also immensely proud to be supporting today's launch. Um, one of the treats associated with supporting today's launch was actually getting a preview copy of the report yesterday morning, which is very, very exciting. It nearly broke the printer at our charity, but it was immensely exciting to, to read. Um, and, and before today kicks off, I wanted to just give you two challenges which really leapt to my mind last night when I, when I, when I read the report. Um, the first one is, is around the fact that actually absolutely rightly um, the, um, the, the report is couched in, in our shared ambitions around the fourth goal for sustainable development, that ambition that every child should have a quality education and globally every adult should be able to access um, lifelong learning. But of course the challenge is that's not how we tend to read these reports. We tend to read these reports as a series of league tables and that's challenging and difficult because actually making ourselves better and keeping our own eye on the ball doesn't necessarily always lead to that fourth development goal. It reminds me a bit of the issues around, around social mobility. Um, Sometimes when we talk about social mobility, we confuse relative social mobility and absolute social mobility. You know, the desire for ourselves or our communities to get better, or individuals to get better, as opposed to actually everybody in society getting better. So those two tendencies, both like relative and the absolute, kind of sit within the report. And I think one of the key challenges I got from reading the report was absolutely how do we, as a society, learn and compete um, in terms of our econ economic and education um, delivery, but actually, more generally, how do we reconcile that with a shared commitment to ensuring that that sustainable development goal is globally delivered? So the first challenge was that. The second challenge, the second challenge was actually, quite frankly, the title education at a glance. Now, I have to say, when I saw that we were working on, a, on, a, on the launch of a document called Education at a Glance, in my head, I saw a postcard, <laughs> perhaps with six traffic lights on it. I did not see 490 pages. But of course, the truth is that actually education at a glance requires a lingering glance. It actually requires us to look at, as I say, the social, the economic, the political environment, and understand how actually the codependencies build up a story. Um, certainly for me, some of the key themes which came through about the UK education system were cumulative. Absolutely and fantastically, we see GDP um, expenditure within the UK being one of the highest in the OECD countries on education. Fantastic. But then five pages later, we discovered that actually that may be true for some parts of our education system, but actually our early years sector is amongst the most underfunded against GDP in the OECD group. So, it's a complex picture. At a glance, is perhaps underselling something which is complicated. And holding on to that complexity as we analyze the data is absolutely key to making sense and doing justice to it. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say is that it's immensely powerful. Andreas has just arrived. And um, some of us have to scoot off a little bit early because of what Andreas said earlier this year. Earlier this year at the, um, at the, the Global Education and Skills Forum, um, uh, Andreas challenged the education system of the world to think about fake news. Um, and lo and behold, a group of us are meeting with MPs and members of the House of Lords um, later this morning to discuss how actually we need to review um, education provision in the UK to think about how critical literacy and inferential reading and inferential literacy is taught better to help young people understand fake news. So today is complex. Today is about how we reconcile our own individual national interests with a global commitment. But also today is immensely powerful. Today should impact as um, Andres' words around fake news did, both on legislators and also on third sector and on practitioners. So have a wonderful morning. It's a great privilege to be here. It's an even greater privilege to help support today's event. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? 
Great. Uh, I'm Natalie Pereira. I'm the Executive Director at the Education Policy Institute. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to Melanie and her colleagues in KPMG for hosting our, us today at this lovely venue, um, and to Jonathan and colleagues at the, the uh, National Literacy Trust too. We're very delighted to be able to work with two um, organisations who are clearly so passionate uh, about education. So welcome all today. This is in fact the second year, um, second consecutive year, that we've launched this report for the OECD. And as always, it's a great pleasure for us to work with Andreas and his colleagues to help disseminate and to publicise such important findings. And that's not just here in London, but indeed across the globe. So as we've heard, today's report covers a wide range of education features across several developed countries. And from the early years to adult education, this report really provides us with one of the most comprehensive studies of international trends to date. Well, why is that important? It's really important for organisations like mine to have relevant data to compare our educational performance and system to inform the public debate and public understanding and to influence um, future policy making in an evidence-based and data-driven way. <clears throat> so um, I'll hand over to Andreas in a minute and he'll talk us through the key findings of the report. As we've heard, it's rather long, um, but Andreas has synthesized it and uh, will be covering, or he will be covering, some issues that are particularly pertinent to uh, our current education debate. So look out for some really interesting messages there uh, on early years funding, also on higher education funding, which has had a lot of coverage in, in the media over the past few months, and of course on uh, teacher pay. Um, I will then uh, share some Q&A with um, Andreas before we break for coffee. Now, please don't all run away at the coffee break if, unless you know, you've got a parliamentary thing you can't avoid, um, because we do have an excellent panel lined up uh, for a discussion about the findings after the, co uh, after the coffee break, and that will be chaired by my colleague Peter Sellen. So thank you again for coming. Um, I'll now hand over to Andreas. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank Natalie and Jonathan and Melanie for actually hosting us so graciously. I think that's a fantastic venue to talk about education. And as you can see, and as you just heard, I'm going to test your glance. It's going to be quite extensive in the <laughs> analysis. But education is a complex matter. And I think it is important that we look at this in sufficient nuance. The first thing that this year's indicator shows so clearly is that the demand for better education continues to expand. You know, those of you who have a long memory actually may remember that it was in this country in the early 2000s that someone said, well, I want everybody, every second person at least, to get a university degree. And many people said that was completely crazy. No. And actually, if you look around the world, at least the industrialized world, that's what we pretty much see today. Basically, half of the population, the young population, 25 to 33-year-olds, now have either a university degree or an equivalent vocational education. I think that's also an important message. We should no longer you know, say where you come from, what institutions, but what kind of skills and qualification have you got. There are many countries that have actually excellent tertiary vocational routes providing same level of skills. No? So that has become a reality. No? You know, I know there are some people who always say, well, there are too many people going into universities and they should go to some alternative kind of provision. But, you know, they typically talk about other people's children. And they also might have said in the last century the same thing about, you know, secondary schooling. No? In the last century, we might have had the same debate, you know, how many people do we actually need to go to school? No? Well, at the end of that century, everybody went. And today... At the end of this century, probably you're going to see everybody completing some form of tertiary education. That is now the entrance ticket to the knowledge economy. When you actually see um, 
again, this is the half mark. When you actually look at people entering tertiary education, you can see numbers are even higher. In New Zealand, it's a bit inflated because lots of people are foreign students. We include them here, so actually you, you need to net that out. But you can see also there the UK is quite well positioned, but you can see across countries it's pretty well over half of the people now entering some tertiary education with a lot of change. You know, Mexico is an interesting case, a country that is catching rap rapidly up from the bottom. Germany did not have a strong tradition of university education no, because of its strong vocational sector, but you can see catching up pretty close to the OECD average. Denmark in a similar situation. So actually tertiary education is clearly the norm among younger people today. Now, STEM. Everybody talks about science, technology, mathematics, engineering, and so on. You can see the UK really well positioned when you look at you know, information and communication technology, which is associated with strong earnings. I think the UK is doing really well. When you look to natural sciences, they're just doing so-so. And when you look at engineering and manufacturing, it's actually pretty small, the share of people going into those fields. And I'm saying this because there are a lot of people in this country who say, well, we want to strengthen our industrial base, those kinds of things. That's actually not yet happening. And at least when you look at those people entering tertiary education, and you know, those who enter are going to graduate, those are going to be tomorrow's workforce. So that is still relatively small as a share. But overall, you, know, you can see the UK pretty much on the left side of the chart, which actually is telling you there are lots of people moving into STEM areas. STEM is and remains a strength, but not so much in the fields of engineering, manufacturing, and construction that actually are pretty important today. That's about STEM. Men and women, now we can see across the board, you know, they're still predominantly males who are going into the STEM fields, no? but the UK is better positioned than most countries. No? You can see, relatively speaking, there's room to expand. Now, this is the 50% line, so in all countries, you know, you have more males and females going into those fields. But in the UK, it's certainly a lot better than in the case of Japan. You know, Japan is a country of technology, but actually its STEM graduates are quite low, modest, also the entrance. And the big reason behind this is that women don't go into those kinds of fields of study. Now, what's interesting is this. People don't make up their minds when they, when they enter university. We can see those outcomes already measured, mirrored in the PISA results at age 15. When we ask young 15-year-olds, young, uh, you know, what do you want to do in your life? Actually, we see that, you know, you take Men and women, boys and girls in the UK, have the same score in science. They know as much no, when it comes to their cognitive skills. But you ask girls, you know, when you go on a STEM career, and actually the share is much lower than among boys. We see that mirrored in the attitudes of parents. No? You take a boy and a girl with the same science score on the PISA scale, the parents are much more likely to expect their boys, to, sons to be engineers and their daughters. So there are a lot of things going on. Those attitudes are framed very early on in people's lives, maybe actually well beyond before uh, 15 as well. So I think changing those patterns is not just a matter of cognitive abilities. We've more or less done that. Uh, math and science and so on, gender differences are no longer pronounced. OECD countries have got that part right, but when it comes to the social and emotional attachment of people with those fields, there's huge gender gaps, and you can see them playing out in this. The reason I'm showing you this here, because later on you're going to see that there are big earnings gaps between men and women with university qualifications. Some people say, well, that's about employers not paying fair wages to men and women. That's not the real story. The real story is this one. Now, the people make different choices. They do have consequences for their lives. You see that in this kind of data. Mo looking into mobility, now, this is about you know, to what extent does your propensity to go into tertiary education depends on your parents also having done so. And you can see there's a big gap between people's ed parents' educational attainment in all countries. Now. Education is everywhere sort of portrayed as a big equalizer, no? enabling people you know, to realize the potential and all of that. But actually, in fact, education often reinforces social disparities. No? Parental attainment is a big factor in the UK, so more so than on average. No? Some countries are doing much better on this. You look at Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Japan, and so on. 
Um, but there's also sort of a lot of cross-country variation. You know, I find it really interesting. You look at Singapore, and you can see someone coming from a disadvantaged background, not parents having, no parents having higher education, has a higher likelihood to move into, you know, tertiary education than someone from the advantaged background in Germany. So both in relative terms and in absolute terms, we see huge differences in social mobility. You know. It's the one thing where we can do a lot better and also that starts early in the lives of people. What you see here is pretty much already mirrored in the schooling results from PISA that we see early in the lives of people. And so again, you know, reaping the potential of all people is still a big unrealized potential. Now, why does it all matter? One thing that we measure every year is the kind of economic and social returns of better education and you can basically see it matters hugely in terms of employment across countries. If you're in the red dot, that means you haven't completed high school in the UK, they would be not getting five good GCSEs. And you can see employment chances are a lot lower. Now, tertiary education, vocational education, sort of mixed patterns. In some countries, they're equal. In some countries, you see a gap. But overall, education is a big factor driving employment. We can also see that um, <clears throat> if you are tertiary educated, people are pretty much as highly employed as in before the crisis. That is not true for the lower end of the kind of spectrum. No. Basically what the crisis has done is has made the gap permanent. No. Those which advanced skills, you know, have pretty much, you know, reached what they were before. Those who have not, you know, made the sort of basic line qualifications are now permanently excluded from labor market participation. Because companies have restructured their business and they basically have you know, automated certain kind of jobs, increased productivity, and that's sort of keeping those people without baseline qualifications now out of this. You can also see that the <coughs> uh, variation across fields of study is something that I wanted to show you. Unfortunately, I don't have data for the UK, but you can generally see that the STEM fields look better. No? But also that you have to look carefully at this. Now, basically, one of the things that we see is that employment is very strong for people who go into technology and so on. But when you look for natural science, math, and so on, it's quite similar to the arts and the humanities. Now. Which is actually sort of people always say, you, you go into arts and humanities, you have no future. It's actually not true. No. Employment among those fields is pretty similar to if you go into a sort of academic sciences. Now, if you go into science and in, in, in engineering and IT, that's what boosts your earnings, but it's not STEM as a whole. It's a very, very important point to keep in mind. No? Education is not doing so well. No, that's something I think we look at, but the choices that you make matter in terms of, of employment, and they matter in terms of your income. No? And income is something that we look at next. This is the earnings disadvantage for not having completed your five good GCSEs. That's the earnings premium you get from completing tertiary education. You can see it's really, really huge. You talk about you know, more than 50% of a bonus you get. Uh, that is a lot of money. Now in the UK, you can, some people have said now, once we see this huge expansion of tertiary graduates, the rise sort of, of earnings will somehow flatten off. No. They've actually not seen that around the world. In the UK, sort of a slight dip, you know, it used to be 58%, now it's 53%, five percentage points. Very, very modest kind of decline in earnings. But in many countries, actually, the earnings premium has risen further. No. Despite the fact that we're putting more graduates into the world, earnings premium continues to rise. No. Isn't that amazing? Because a lot of people who used to say, well, university is just sorting people. No. The people with the degrees would have earned the same salaries without going to university because they were the smart kids from bright families and wealthy families. Well, if they had, would have been right, we would have seen a decline in the earnings premium. We have not. There are other people who said, well, when you get more people into the labor market, graduates are going to end up with doing non-graduate jobs, and you're going to see a decline in earnings because employers are not going to pay for that. We have not actually seen that, at least not at scale. What we have seen is there's more variability. In the past, you know, a degree was a guarantee to get a good paid job, and so on today, you know, it can be great, it can be not so great. There's more variability, there's a greater risk people take when they study, but overall, it's a pretty good 
business for people, the earnings returns are high. They vary hugely. If you look to South America, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, <coughs> there is still a very kind of small elite going to higher education. That's what drives those earnings. But you know, in, in, in most countries, we're talking about at least 50% of better earnings. That's really quite important. We see when we look at the UK, one specific feature, adding a master's is actually not adding very much to your earnings. What drives your earnings is really about getting a bachelor. <coughs> and um, that's something, I think, to keep in mind. But overall, returns are robust on average. There's more variability, but on average, they remain robust. Um, <coughs> going to skip that. Um, let's look at investment. You can see, you know, growing benefits from higher education, growing spending. In most countries, actually, between 2010 and 14, we have seen sort of continued rise in the financing of uh, higher education, tertiary education. Not in all, some spending has declined, but of course you have always to see that in the context of changing numbers of students. No? You look at Turkey, and uh, Turkey is interesting, you know, more than doubling in investment in tertiary education but also an increase in 50% in student participation. So unit costs have increased, but much of this has been eaten up. You look at the next country there, Estonia, huge increase in investment, despite the financial crisis. I'm coming to this later on because many people say in the UK, you know, you know, we had to cut educational spending because we, we ran out of money and so on. But you know, look to Estonia. It's a country that ran through a very, very difficult period, but continued to massively expand has a kind of demography where there are fewer students now, so unit costs have really become quite good there now. You look at the other end of the spectrum, you can see Denmark, and a huge increase in students. You saw that before. A little bit less money. Actually, Danish university are now worse off than they were. Now, Ireland, no. big cut in spending, small increase in students, drawing sort of expenditure per student down. So the trend has not been universal, but globally, I think it's pretty, pretty robust. No. Let's have a look at you know, spending in absolute terms. Now, this is basically when you add up the money that people spent between primary and tertiary education. And there you can see the UK comes out very high. Now it's about $24,000 per tertiary students, a lot more than the OECD average. Now some people say in tertiary education you should only look at the money that actually ends up for students, excluding research. But even if you do that, the UK comes out with a lot more money than that do most other countries in the OECD. So significant investment in total, but also in, uh, on a per student basis. But let's have a look at this in a bit more detail, but because the devil often lies in the detail of those kinds of spending figures. Actually, right. the first question is, you know, where does the money actually come from? The, Blue part reflects public expenditure on tertiary education, uh, the relative share. Then comes basically household and other private expenditure. And you can see there's no country that generates more resources from private sources than the UK for uh, the tertiary sector. It's a growing trend. You see that clearly as a trend across countries that the expansion that we see in most countries is predominantly financed by household expenditure. But in the UK, that trend is clearly most pronounced. Now, I think that's a very important part. Rising tuition fees, now, and you can see we have actually looked at those in more detail this year. This is tuition on public institutions. You can see a whole range of countries where there is actually still no tuition. But then, you know, some countries, and you can see the UK, particularly when you go to private institutions, actually all of your institutions are sort of considered private on that because they're independent, you can see tuition levels are pretty high. Not as high as in the US, you know, that's about, we would have need another screen on the next floor. Uh, I mean, in, in fact, you know, tuition in the US has gone beyond any proportion. There's no relationship between tuition and the value students get anymore in the United States. And that actually tells you why it is so important for you to have actually capped expenditure. You know, you capped them at 9,000 pounds. If you had capped them at higher levels, you know, Universities have probably exploited that because universities can always capture the lifetime earnings. You know, people are always incentivized to spend a lot of money on higher education because it's a good business for people. The rate of return is very high, but it's not really fair for universities. Universities should only charge you for the value they add, not for what you bring through your own talents and so on. But that's how markets sometimes operate. Now, 
high sort of levels of tuition. And of course, the interesting thing is some, in some countries it varies by field of study. I'm not going to go through this. How do you back it up? And this is, I think, where the UK is doing uh, is quite well. There are, Finland is an interesting case. You know, there's no tuition in Finland, and still a high share of students get uh, scholarships and grants, no? free money from the government. Why does the government do that? Well, they actually want more students to go to university because they know that the fiscal returns are really, really high. No? And they pay for the living expenses and whatever students need to actually go to university, no? despite not having tuition. You can look at the uh, UK, or I must say England in this case, where actually there's a big investment in public loans. Most students actually get access to public money. It is income contingent, so you don't take much of a risk. That's very, very important. It's very different from the United States or Japan or Korea, where you basically are on your own. You may get a government guaranteed loan, but you have to pay it back, whatever your income. And I think that's a big strength of the UK or Australia or New Zealand system that is basically risk-free access to money. And you know, despite of what you read in the newspapers, he says it's still a good business for people. There should be every incentive for people to actually to get better degrees. But I think that's a very important kind of uh, point to make. You have countries like Norway, it's also interesting. No? Norway has no tuition, higher education is free, and still they give their people not only grants like Finland, you know, there the money is really free, often they give them loans. And again, it's for students' living expenditures. No? The Nordic countries have really figured out that you know, higher education is a big asset for the country and that you know, both individuals and the public have every reason to invest their resources in this. Uh, interesting, and then you have countries you know, where people are on their own. In the case of Switzerland, it doesn't matter so much because tuition is very low, but in the case of Japan and Korea, it's a huge burden on families. No? So different ways of backing this up, so you can say, UK has the highest share of private spending, but still, you know, there is a good way for, for young people to get access to money. Is it worth it? Well, we calculate, again, you know, the costs on the red part against the benefits, and you can see in every country, you know, for, when you calculate this over your working life, the benefits are hugely outweighing the costs. On average, that is always an important point to make, you know. There are some people who become super rich and some people who don't become wealthy. So this is just the average. But on average, you, know, you talk about $300,000 that people get out over the life cycle compared with upper secondary qualifications. And compared to that, actually, you know, the big cost that you have is not the tuition. Not in the UK, nowhere else. The biggest cost that you have is actually what you could have earned while you study. No? The foregone earnings, that is the major factor. And we, so actually, if you can anything, do anything to improve the quality of higher education and shorten the duration, you'll actually add much more than lowering tuition. And I think it's a very important point. Now, this is for men. I should have said that at the beginning. We do the same thing for women. Actually, the costs are the same, but the benefits tend to be lower. And that is because, you know, study choices, field of study is the greater incident of part-time work, lots of things driving this. But you, could, you look at a country like Japan, the gap is huge. No? Why is that? Because many very well-educated women in Japan never get the chance to get a job that uses tertiary qualifications. So I think that's very important to be in mind. This is for people. Here you can see the same picture for taxpayers. And you can see, of course, the numbers are smaller no? because part of the benefits you take home for yourself. No? That's your increased salary. But actually, a big part actually goes back to society. No? You pay more taxes. You pay lower social contributions. You take less money from the state for you know, unemployment insurance and things like this. And you can really see, for taxpayers, you talk about benefits you know, on average across OECD countries of $200,000 per student that a government makes profit from every graduate going into the field over the life cycle. It's a lot of money, and that shows us you know, why it's a good thing for governments to take their share in, in investment in higher education. A little bit on internationalization. There's a lot in the book, but I'm going to cut that very brief because the story is quite similar to our previous studies. Uh, basically, we saw a huge increase in the 90s, and things have sort of pretty much flattened out, but you talk about you know, fair sort of almost 5 million young people who go around countries for the purpose of studies. 
which is actually great economically, it's great socially, it's great culturally. I think it's the biggest thing that we can do for example, for connecting our society, so building the kind of social capital and so economic capital that actually helps people moving. How does it look across countries? Chart is a bit complicated. On the horizontal axis, I show you the student outflow now. Who is going out of the country? And you can see in the Slovak Republic, Luxembourg, but also uh, many of the Baltic states, Ireland, lots of people, actually young people, go out of the country to study. Not the case for the UK. Actually, you have one of the lowest shares of people studying abroad. It's a real pity. No? On the vertical axis, you, show the uh, you see the student inflow. No? Who's going to come to your country for the purpose of study? And that's where you can see countries like UK, New Zealand, Australia are doing really, really well. A couple of countries do well on both dimensions, no? Switzerland, Austria, Canada, France, Germany. You, know, you can say decent share of young people going out, decent share of people coming into the country. No? But, uh, so there is mobility, but mobility is very imbalanced. No? What's also interesting, you know, if you look in the United States, Simply because the United States actually is also a good example in the sense that actually it's not, people always think this is where everybody goes to study. No? But you look at where the United States is right down there. Basically, if you look at this in relative shares, inflows are relative, very modest, no? a lot lower than in most European countries. No? Netherlands, Denmark, Canada, Belgium do a lot better in attracting international students. And the reason why this is like this, because when we talk about higher education in the United States, we always think about you know, Harvard and Stanford and those kinds of places. You look at the average college, it's not so attractive for people to go there. Neither in terms of the quality people get, nor in terms of the tuition people pay. You know, UK would be a lot, lot more attractive in relative terms. But also, you know, outflows are very, very limited. You know. Of course, you know, these are big countries and therefore absolute numbers are very, very large. But once you know you add China into the picture, you can make that argument, or India, you can make that argument for other countries too. So I think that's the proper way to look at this. Rising student flow is still quite sort of uh, mobile. Where do people go? Most Asians go to the English-speaking world. When you look at continental Europe, as much of the circulation happens inside Europe, from Eastern Europe and so on. So patterns are quite interesting. You know, France gets a lot you know, from Africa and other, other countries, so interesting. What do people do? You can see that most clear is at the doctorate levels. No? Basically what I show you here in the green triangle, you're going to see where students studies that are more attractive to international students. And you can basically see, oops, sorry. You can see engineering and manufacturing as what <coughs> disproportionately attracts international students, natural science a bit, and so on, information and communication technology. Those are the kind of fields where people actually move out of the country to study elsewhere, whereas health and welfare, you study nationally, education as well. Those are still very nationally or domestically framed kind of subjects, arts and humanities. So again, interesting patterns for the first time we were able to look at this by field of study. Now, that's all been a great story, story for education, but as I said, I was talking about averages. Once you actually drill down, you can see actually still, you know, a lot of people are left behind. And one of the things I did this year is, you know, people always said when you look at graduation by the typical, by the age of graduation, well, you know, some people just complete their degree later, so don't take this number so serious. So this year, I looked at two years later, no? uh, basically when you should have completed and two years afterwards. And you can see, you look at the UK or Portugal and Europe, there's still a large share of people who basically never graduate from baseline qualifications. Now, when you look at upper secondary education. So I think it's a sizable share of people in many countries which actually do not get the entrance ticket to the knowledge economy, which is, you know, five good GCCs. Now. And, uh, you know, in Brazil, you can understand why, but if you look in Europe, uh, Sweden, another country, you know, where there is a sort of countries with a strong tradition still, a lot of people being left behind. This has consequences. Yeah. I already mentioned employment for tertiary graduates, great, and basically at, at, at pre crisis levels. When you look at the same picture for um, people who have not been completing high school, five good GCSEs or equivalent vocational education, you can really see how in most countries, 
that has deteriorated. Now in the UK, currently the employment situation is very good, but you know, once employment actually worsens, you're going to see those people hit because that's exactly what happened in most countries. Now, when people are losing jobs, those people are going to lose their jobs first. Now. So I think it's something worse to look at. Very quick look at transition from school to work. You know, for most people, it works quite well. But um, when you look at the age group 18 to 24 years, you can see in many countries people are still in education, uh, Slovenia, Denmark, Luxembourg, the Netherlands. In the UK, sort of education is no longer sort of the dominant picture in your life. Uh, there are a lot of people in employment already. No? Many young people in the UK actually are already in employment, not so much in education. But then there is a share of people who are not in education and unemployed. The good news is that part actually has slightly declined in the UK. There used to be a big part of the story, you know, but actually now you can see because of the good employment situation, the needs, as we call them, are a little bit in decline, not so in other countries. And, uh, but there is another share of people, and they're actually also quite to worry about. They are not in education and no longer looking for employment. Now, those are the people who have really given up. And you can see in many countries it's a quite sizable group of young people who are basically out of the picture. At a young age, you know, I'm talking about 18 to 24 year olds, you know, people which, which you would want to see actively in some ways. When you look at trends on that, you can basically see actually here's a short, yeah. If you look at uh, Israel, it's a, it's a country that had a huge problem with this now. 40% in 2005 in the need category, and you can see it's really, really done well in getting more people into either employment or um, work. But you can see if, if you look to, and Turkey as well, no, need has really declined. But when you look to Italy and Spain, that's actually a lot worse now than it used to be in 2005. So quite important changes, and some of them are explained by the general labor market conditions but some not. In some countries, there's been really, I think, a very successful effort to actually reduce those kinds of patterns. We can see, you know, some people say it's employment, but actually a lot of this comes down to skills. On the vertical axis, I show you literacy skills of people. No? I think that's a very important ingredient of whatever qualifications you have. On the horizontal axis, the share of people not in education, not in employment. And you can see those things pretty much line up. So this is not just labor market conditions. Actually not having, you know, literacy is a sort of currency in our kind of life, uh, social <coughs> times. And actually you can see where you don't have those literacy skills, your likelihood to be also neither in employment nor in education increases quite disproportionately. See that really well in, in, in South America. Brief note on vocational programs, some really interesting analysis in this year's edition. I know it's a big topic in, in, in your country here, so let's have a look at this. This is basically completion in uh, upper secondary education. There you can really see the UK lags quite significantly behind the OECD average, no different from most OECD countries. Uh, that's actually not the participation, I'll come to that in a moment. But if you look at sort of participation levels, um, <coughs> In um, general levels, they're quite high. When you look at vocational programs, uh, participation in the UK is still quite low. It's a topic of discussion, but you look at actual participation patterns, it's quite low. We also see, and that's important, that most OECD countries actually invest more per vocational student than an academic student. It's actually quite expensive to provide really good vocational education. In our ju judgment, you know, vocational education is only effective if it has a serious work-based component. If it really offers people, you know, real opportunities to work with real people in real workplaces and so on. The work-based component is, is important, is also a big cost driver. That's why in most countries, uh, they spend more on vocational than academic education. It's different in the UK, which spends less per vocational student than for academic students, not 12% of GDP. Uh, per capita invested in upper secondary general programs, 0.5% in vocational, 1.2% uh, <coughs> invested in upper secondary, and then 0.5% in vocational, 
on average, it's six for both. Some countries, in most countries, slightly more. So that's an important caveat to, to really make that actually both participation levels and spending per student in the UK is below the OECD average when it comes to vocational education. Now, let's come to money again. I had talked already about spending and investment for tertiary education. We have, of course, also analyzed this for basic skills, now, schooling, and so on. And there you can see also big changes. Now, the blue bar, again, you know, change in expenditure. Countries like Turkey, Israel, and the UK actually having increased their spending between 2010 and 2014. In all of the countries, there's also been more students, but in the case of the UK, you can see sort of overall spending per student has got better. Now, you have to look at this, though, in a nuance. So in the last two years, it's gone again the other way around. And uh, you look here at the case of you know, Ireland or Spain, you had increases in student numbers, no? but decreases in spending levels. And so spending per student has actually significantly declined in those countries. So in general, more investment also in basic skills, not as much as in higher education. Higher education has really been the priority for most countries, but still continued growth in spending. How, where has the money gone? That's, of course, always important. No, one slide also, you are, to judge that, it's always good to see this in the relative changes of the economy. The blue bar here shows you public expenditure on education, and the light blue bar shows you changes in the size of the economy. So you can see again, you know, to take countries like Turkey, like Korea, like the Slovak Republic, you can basically see the economy has expanded. There was more money available, but actually spending on education has risen even faster. So basically it shows that edu education has both improved in relative and absolute terms as a priority. You go to Spain, you can see the economy has actually shrunk, but actually money for education was cut even faster. So actually when the Spanish say, well, you know, we just had to cut spending on education because our economy declined, well, actually, no, you cut education spending more than your economy declined. You can say the same thing about Italy. The United States is interesting. Actually, you could see that basically GDP increased between 2008 and 2014. But spending on education declined. So they've basically cut a lot of money in the financial crisis and never came back to pre-crisis levels. And that's basically why actually <coughs> education expenditure on education as a share of GDP has declined in the case of these kinds of countries. But sort of mixed picture, more mixed than in higher education, but overall still, I think, on balance, uh, continued investment. Now, how is money being spent? Teachers, no. the quality of education can never exceed the quality of your teachers. So making teaching financially attractive is important. And you can actually see in the majority of countries, teachers earn quite a bit less than people with similar qualifications. No. And uh, England is a case in point, uh, Scotland even more. No. And I'm saying this also because in most countries, actually, in the last few years, Teachers, again, you know, have improved their financial standing. Countries were hit in the financial crisis, but afterwards, spending on teacher salaries has picked up again. That's not the case in the case of England and Scotland, where actually teacher salaries are actually in decline. Actually, yeah. So this is a measure where we basically look to relative to the earnings of other people with a college or university degree. Now, that's a fair comparison for teachers. Those are the kind of people that they want to compare with. And you can see in most countries, it goes sort of to the negatives. The exceptions are Portugal, Luxembourg, Latvia, and uh, Greece, where teachers are relatively paid better than university graduates would otherwise be. That, I think, is a sin significant finding. Here, you can see that in absolute terms. No? Before, I showed you salaries relative to other well-educated workers. Now, I show you salaries in absolute terms, in purchasing power priorities. This diamond, the blue di dark blue diamond, is where you start. And then the uh, light blue square is at the top of the scale. And you can see countries differ both in starting salaries 
uh, but neither England and Scotland are really competitive on that. And countries differ both in the uh, top of the salary scale, and there you can say, at least in the case of England, there's a lot of career growth. And actually, we think that's important. You know, it's not just about starting salaries. It's also, you know, what career opportunities are there for people. And that's an area, you know, if you make it to the top of the salary scale, actually you get a decent pay in the case of, the, you, in, in the case of England. You know? But as I said, you know, salaries in England fell by 12% and in Scotland by 6% in real terms between 2005 and 2015 while on average across countries they rose by 10% at pre-primary, 6% at primary and lower secondary, and 4% at upper secondary levels. Countries in relative terms have improved salaries of primary teachers. We think that's a good thing because there's actually no intrinsic reason why you know, teachers at higher levels of education should be better paid than you know, in primary or even pre-primary levels. So I think there has been some adjustment in that direction. That's a good thing. And there have been some improvements but actually there are exceptions to this and England and Scotland are clearly one of those exceptions. Now, class size is another factor that's driving spending and you can see in most countries, this is primary education, here you can see lower secondary education. In most countries, class sizes have declined. In some countries, that's demography. No? Countries like Japan running out of students and uh, Estonia and so on, they have basically big demographic decline. They don't know what to do with a teacher, so that's basically why classes become smaller. But in other countries, it's policy. It's a very popular thing to do. You know, if you reduce the class size, you know, everybody will like you, the teachers, the parents, the, uh, everybody in society. It's not necessarily a very smart thing to do because the price you pay for this, if you don't invest more money in education, is you either can't pay your teachers properly or, you know, teachers have very little time for other things than teaching. This is the case in the UK, and so on. So there's always a price tag attached to smaller classes. And but, as you can see, it's been a pretty dominant trend across countries, including in the UK. This being said, you know, in primary education, classes are quite large. They tend to increase. It's only in secondary education that UK classes are, relatively speaking, small. But again, you know, it's a popular thing but there's a price for this to pay. I'm going to come for that, to that in a minute. Here you see also something interesting. On the horizontal axis, I show you the student-teacher ratio. Yeah. On the vertical axis, I show you the class size. And if you don't think about it for a lot, you might think, well, they should be the same. You know, if I have more teachers, I can make my classes smaller. But you can see not all countries are doing that. You look at, you compare the UK and Japan. They have both the same student-teacher ratio. Both invest a similar number of teachers for every 100 students. But in Japan, the class size is a lot larger <coughs> than in the UK. In the UK, the class size is quite low in secondary education. In Japan, it's very high. So what's going on here? Well, the answer is, if you're a teacher in Britain, you do very little else than teaching. You have a very high teaching load, lots of hours of teaching. If you're a teacher in Japan, you know, you teach about half of what a British teacher teaches, but you actually don't work less. You work more than the British teachers. Working hours for Japanese teachers are longer than for British teachers. So what are those Japanese teachers do? Well, they spend a lot of time with individual students on courses, on tutoring, on providing additional support. They spend a lot of time with parents. They spend a lot of time on professional collaboration. They design and plan the lessons together. They evaluate the lessons. They typically look at each other's classrooms. There's a lot of things going on, and those things are actually very, very important. We have good data that's not from Education at a Glance, but from our TALIS survey that actually shows that professional collaboration among teachers is one of the biggest drivers of self-efficacy of teachers and of job satisfaction, much bigger than class size. When you ask teachers, you know, what drives your professional interest? It's often those kinds of factors. No? To what extent do I work with my colleagues to frame good practice? To what extent do I invest in my career and the career of my colleagues? No? So I talked about salaries. There's clearly a lot to do for the UK to make teaching financially more attractive. But I think there's also a good argument to make teaching intellectually more attractive. No? And when you look at long-term teacher supply, maybe that may be even the bigger factor. And you can see really here, Countries make different choices how to invest their resources. No? It's not that Japan 
invests more in terms of resources than the UK to allow for all of the things that teachers can do in Japan. It's that they spend the money differently. I mean, that's a really important pattern. Teaching time, I already said, it's pretty high in the case of both England and Scotland compared internationally. And uh, it varies a lot across countries, no? the number of teaching hours in, uh, that people have to teach. But I already said this, there's been slight changes in countries, generally to the better, giving teachers more time for professional development, but actually not in universal terms. Here you can see that in a different way. On the horizontal axis, I show you the number of teaching hours per year. And I already said it's quite high in the UK. And then on the vertical axis, you see the amount of time that you spend, of your working time that you spend teaching. And there you can see in the UK and Scotland, actually, if you discount Colombia, actually there's no country where actually the relative share of your working time that you spend teaching is higher, now, leaving actually more limited room for teachers to do other things than teaching. And I said, you know, Japan, Estonia, those countries, Korea, that share is actually pretty low. So, and one of the things that we can do is we can look at how those factors influence the overall cost of an education system. Unfortunately, I can't do that for the UK because I don't have all of the data, but I just wanted to sort of show you this because I think it's a really important part of the pattern. First of all, salaries. No? Obviously, salaries are always a big driver of costs of education. You can see in some countries the blue bar is going up. That makes education more expensive. In other countries, the blue bar is going down. Teachers are not paid so well. That drives costs down. But it's only one of the factors. The second factor that I want to show you, if this thing goes on, is actually the instruction time. If you make school days long, that costs you money. The orange bar goes up. If you make school days short, that cuts your cost, the orange bar goes down. And you can see it goes differently in different countries. There's a third factor. The, okay, the green bar, that's about teaching time. You know, if you ask your teachers to teach a lot of hours, you save money. If you give your teachers time for other things in teaching, it increases money. So uh, basically pushes costs up. And the last factor is class size. I already mentioned, you know, Japan and Korea are interesting. You know, what drives costs down is class size. No? They have large classes that cuts costs. That allows them to give teachers lots of time for other things than teaching, to create that kind of professional environment. And they also, you know, pay their teachers generously. Their blue bar is going up as well. And that the result is actually Japan and Korea spend not more than the average country uh, across the OECD countries. And everybody who's going to these countries, you visit a school, you say, well, this wonderful environment that teachers have, they can do all of those kinds of things. But actually, the net costs are not high. The cost of education on a per student basis, other things equal, is similar. You compare that with, with Greece here. No? What has Greece done? Well, you know, they want small classes, driving costs up. They also want their teachers to do lots of other things in teaching, drives costs up. <coughs> but because they don't have much money, you can actually see teachers are poorly paid, really poorly paid, and you can see students don't have much learning time. So you can see the huge, if you are in a country like Greece that is not really wealthy, you can see the huge cost of small classes. Or you look at the United States, quite similar. No? Spending patterns similar, what's driving uh, costs up there are uh, salaries on the one hand, and, um, uh, but also there teachers have little time for other things in teaching that cuts costs down. So the point really in a nutshell is that it's not so much how much you invest per student. It's really a lot to do with how you optimize your spending patterns to maximize results. If you look at that chart long enough, you actually find that most countries that do well on PISA tend to prioritize the quality of teachers and teaching over things like the size of classes. They may consistently inve investment patterns that keep, keep teaching not just financially attractive, but intellectually attractive. I think that's the big lesson we can learn, particularly from countries like Japan and Korea, on that kind of chart. Very briefly, age and gender distribution. This is not a new story. I think we all know that, that basically in the case of uh, England, the teaching population is pretty young, particularly when you look at uh, lower secondary education for a lot of mobility in the teaching force, 
that's a great opportunity on the one hand, you know, teachers are, you know, coming new with new ideas, they're recently educated, that's a big asset, you know, in Italy, most of the people are over 50, that's much harder sort of to keep teachers, you know, developing. Uh, but it's also liability in terms of turnover can also be something that is quite disruptive. So uh, you lose a lot of great people out of the system. So you look at this in two different ways, but that's not a pattern that is new. And gender patterns is also what we know already from previous editions. Primary education is highly female dominated. As you move up the levels, you know, secondary education becomes more balanced. And in tertiary education, you then have more men basically being professors in education. But it's a pattern that is sort of something that is not really new from this year's edition. <coughs> Two more points. One is early childhood education. I keep that brief because we published recently actually with you, Natalie, on the API, um, a special report on that. Um, overall, you can see enrollment is good in the UK at age three. Intensity is still quite poor, you know, that's a bit deceptive. Here I just look at the children who are in an institution, and actually when you look at the number of hours that children actually are there, that hours is quite low. But, you know, participation uh, rates for three uh, is high, and that is so different from the early 2000s when we had our first data. Now, the UK always used to be at the bottom of the league tables. Now, very few children actually getting access to high-quality education and care. Now, basically, that has dramatically improved and keeps improving. Um, uh, you can see uh, at age four, well, that's obvious in your case because people are basically in school, but in most countries, actually, it's picked up enormously. If you'd ask me, you know, I talk a lot about tertiary education, hugely expanding sector, but the sector that expanded most in OECD countries over the last decade is clearly early childhood education and care. Most countries <coughs> understood that that's where we build foundations, that's where investment bears most returns, that's where we make the case for kind of social mobility. Now, uh, it looks a little bit different when you look actually at spending. There you can see the UK is still pretty much at the bottom end of the scale, and it has to do with intensity, you know, the hours of service that is actually being provided, and, uh, and so on. But uh, this is something, I think, where most countries put a larger share of the national wealth in education than the UK does. And, um, you look at Norway, for example, at Sweden, at Iceland, Slovenia. And uh, again, probably it's not only a, a social commitment those countries make, because this is, again, you know, social mobility is built in, in those, uh, <coughs> those years to a large extent. There's also a good economic arguments that actually show that actually, you know, later returns are actually uh, very high for that investment. But that's an area where I think uh, the UK has not yet seen the trend that we have seen in most other countries. Uh, we've also seen that it's a sector that is still largely uh, privately dominated in the UK and some other countries as well, but in most other countries it's become more of the part of the public school system. Uh, the other story I should have mentioned that, of course, you know, why you see relatively little public investment in early learning is that also in, the, in your case a lot of money is still coming from parents. You know, fees for for, for early childhood education as to quite quite high no? and uh, that's actually true for a number of countries no? in a number of countries you know you can't talk about tuition for university graduates you're going to get a revolution on the streets you know in the country where I live in France you know nobody would touch that topic but actually tuition for small children is quite well established in most OECD countries it's much easier they're not so you know violent on the streets and actually um, <coughs> and actually if you look at this in terms of what's good in terms of public investment, it should be the other way around. I think in a way, you know, you're doing the right thing with your university students, but you should do the same thing with your small children. That, I think, is a case where public money actually is probably much more warranted than it is in the case of tertiary studies. And also provision, you know, pat uh, um, basically the provision of education in early learning is a lot more patchy. You have, you know, in, in, in schools, you have an Ofsted that looks at every school, you know, how things are going, you do tests, you do evaluations. We have a really good picture of the quality of schooling. We have good standards for the quality of teachers. You know, we know who's going to go into the schools, who's teaching our children. You look at early childhood education, there's not really very much that we know. It happens somewhere around the corner, looks nice, but we have actually very, very little really good evidence on the quality. So a big area for further work, lots of progress in quantity, but lots of work. 
Very last slide, it's about lifelong learning. And there you can see the England and, um, and Northern Ireland, the places where I have data for this here, are not that well positioned, but also not so badly. Um, <clears throat> actually, England is sort of better than here Northern Ireland on that picture. But uh, when you look at uh, countries in Northern Europe, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, but also New Zealand, the Netherlands, US, you can see this idea of lifelong learning is better established. No? This is also sort of probably if you think about, you know, the medium term, the long term, that's the big challenge for our societies. No? Everything changes, everything evolves. You, know, you can no longer prepare people once for their lifetime. You need to build in the foundations give people the capacity and motivation to continue learning through life, through our life, and provide the opportunities for people to do that. And you can actually see the number of countries that have actually been successful in establishing this is not that high. Now, our, our societies are still very rigid. Institutional learning is still quite formalized. You know, with big chunks of degrees and qualifications, it's not as granular as it really needs to be for people to sort of decide where they want to learn, when they want to learn, and how they want to learn. Um, that's all, thanks very much. <coughs>
our data show very clearly that teachers, you know, opportunities to collaborate, teachers opportunities to engage in, you know, mutual sharing of knowledge, sharing of information. That's what's driving their sense of being effectiveness of the teacher. That's what's driving that sense of job satisfaction. So I, I, I still think the model of Japan and many other countries as well, Finland would be another kind, is what's making teaching so attractive. And look at the data. You know, Finland doesn't pay its teachers that much better than Britain does. A little bit, but not that much. Why do nine people apply for every job in teacher education? Because their job is interesting. You know, the kind of profile of activities is much more similar to other professional workers. You know, the idea that you spend all your, your time teaching is still sort of pretty much the kind of industrial model. You know? Someone tells you what to do, and now just go and do it. The, Japanese or the Finnish model is more a professional work organization. So don't think this is bureaucracy or administration. It's really a lot of, you know, advancing profession, not about. Let's go over to Mike from the National Numeracy. I'm uh, Mike from National Numeracy. So uh, two things. First, uh, the easy one to answer, Matt, perhaps, is um, to what extent is this sig HE uh, and the stats around HE a signifier effect versus the underlying, the importance of the underlying skills? And the second one was, I just wanted to confirm or check with you that your definition of completing secondary education was getting five good GCSEs. Because if that is the case, um, it's, uh, Natalie knows this is my pet point at the moment, but GCSE is essentially norm referenced or cohort referenced in this country. So the bottom third fail irrespective of absolute attainment. And that might therefore mean that some of the analysis is kind of a truism. The two th top two thirds do better than the bottom third. Yeah. Um, the signifier effect, you know, if that would be true, you know, if it will all be about sorting, you just get some bright people completing universities, they're going to get a lot of earnings, and they would have got it anyway. You would have seen a big decline in the earnings premium in the huge expansion of tertiary education, and that has not been true. In a sense, you know, uh, it may have been, I, I, I really think that what we are seeing here is changes in labor demand, that actually we're moving more to a kind of high skills uh, utilization. The reason I'm saying this, you know, one of this, two years ago, we measured something else. We looked actually at the extent to which people deploy and use their literacy and numeracy skills. And we found the UK actually being at the very top. A lot of people were sort of speculating, you know, we have this over-education. People are more skilled than what they actually need for their job. In fact, apart from the US, there was no country that was extracting better value from the skills of people than was the case in England. So I don't really think, you know, we have a, there is probably some signal. I think the signaling comes through the reputation. You know, if you go to, you know, Oxford and Cambridge, probably there's a lot of signaling involved. But when you average this out, I think you really talk about uh, uh, advantages. At least that's my interpretation. On the second part, yes, we look at five good GCSEs or an equivalent vocational qualifications. And you're absolutely right. There could be, you know, things like, inflation or deflation over time uh, as those things get redefined. That's why I prefer to look at skill measures rather than qualification measures to compare things across countries. No. Thank you. I'll take one more over here and then I think that might be all we'll have time for for now. Um, do you want to, have you got a mic? Thank you. Uh, Celia Hoyles, Institute of Education, University College London. You mentioned, it was almost by passing, and I haven't um, taken in all the reports yet, about how we, we have a relatively young teaching profession, which is good in terms of, you know, professional learning and whatever. But I think there's a downside that I think you also touched upon is that people don't stay very long in our teaching profession. And this actually, the whole idea about it being an intellectually rewarding and we invest in professional learning is absolutely very dear to our hearts for those of us in teaching. But how do we manage this when teachers only stay for a little while? I mean, mathematics where it's really bad in terms of how long they stay. Mm -hmm. And if you invest so much in their learning, particularly in terms of new skills that are needed, uh, for engineering and manufacturing, you mentioned. Where does this go to if they've gone? And you mention a lot Japan, where I don't know the data like you do. As far as I understand it, teachers stay much longer, and so they can invest in learning with their colleagues. I mean, I don't know if this, this sort of caricature of your work is, is correct, but I think this is a big challenge for us here. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think you could make that argument about many occupations now. Some people say, well, you know, why should I invest in people if I lose them? But actually, you know, 
it's a lot worse not to invest in people and keep them. No. I think um, in, in one way, you know, we do have increased labor mobility. And I think the idea that, you know, teachers become teachers and stay that for their lives, you don't see that in other professions. I actually think we should adjust to a more kind of more opportunities for people to get into the profession and more opportunities to get out of the profession. I agree with you, mobility is too high in England, and I think people leave for the wrong reasons. Yeah. You know, not because they want to pursue another career, but simply exactly. because, you know, the teaching isn't what they expected it to be. I think there's a lot to do to make teaching more attractive, and it, part of this has to do with, you know, careers getting interesting, but also making the work simply, you know, more mm -hmm. type of professional, more interesting. I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done, but I do think we have other countries where the picture is the other extreme, you know, where teaching is a golden cage. You become once a teacher, and that public qualifications will be nowhere recognized, you know, Italy, Greece, and Spain. There's nothing else that you can do, so even if you made the wrong choice, there's no way that you can correct it. In your case, I think the positive side of this is really that, you know, if you're a teacher, you're going to have lots of interesting other opportunities. So keeping the right balance, I think what I would work on is to make you know, teaching attractive, that you keep the people who want to become good teachers and who want to do a great job in the profession. There's a lot that the UK could do to do that, particularly in disadvantaged schools, you know, making mm -hmm. teaching a lot more you know, attractive, better supported, and so on. But you know, keep the mobility, the opportunities for people to move out, because that's what we see in virtually every other profession. You know, the argument that you make, I hear from many employers who say, why should I invest in the continuing education training of people you know, if then they use their skills to work somewhere else? I think actually the experience shows that it's actually a win-win for everyone, for people, for employers, and for society if we do invest in, in training. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a very interesting note to end on. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't had as much time to get through all of your questions. We do have um, a great panel for after the coffee break, so please keep some of those questions, um, and I'm sure the panel will be able to reflect on what those findings might mean in practice. If we could reconvene in about 10 minutes, so 5 past 11, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. I hope you've all enjoyed your um, light refreshments. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Peter Sellen. I'm the Chief Economist of the uh, Education Policy Institute, um, and I'm going to be chairing today's um, panel session. Um, so I'd like to um, welcome first uh, Vika Porter, Chief Executive of the Varki Foundation, um, and somebody who served on a range of educational panels for uh, UNESCO, so lots of insights across the world there as well. Um, to his right, Martin Dole, Professor of the Leadership and Further Leadership in Further Education Skills at the Institute of Education, and the former Chief Executive of the Association of Colleges here in England. And Ellie Mulcahy, Senior Research Associate at LKM Co, um, who focuses on early years education and primary schools. And Andrea Schleicher, who you have already met. Uh, and to his right, Dr. Vanessa Ogden, who is currently Chief Executive at Mulberry Schools Trust, um, is also a visiting fellow at the Institute of Education here at UCL. Um, so we're going to have a 45 minute um, panel session here. Um, I'd be grateful if you could all keep your questions concise, because um, there's quite a range of topics we might want to cover today. Um, and also if you could state your name and the organisation you're representing as well, that would be really helpful. Um, so, um, if you've got somebody on the panel you'd specifically like to ask a question of, do say so, otherwise I will um, have a shot at who's probably best place to answer, and if not, we can have a, a free fall there, so I hope that's okay. Um, so, I'm going to kick us off, if that's all right. Um, I'd like to first off, Andreas, um, given we've heard quite a lot today about this international global trend of um, ever-increasing levels of education, particularly amongst young people, um, and in the report, um, you contrasted the case of South Korea, who've <coughs> built that up actually starting in the 1960s, starting first with secondary education and moving on upwards from there. Other countries have done things a bit more kind of concurrently and all at the same time. Have you got any observations about how to ensure that you can increase levels of education without impinging on the quality and ensuring that the outcomes remain consistent? Actually, yes. There are a fair number of countries where we have seen over the last decade big rises in quantity and improvements in quality. You know, I would cite 
Brazil, you know, that has, in, uh, in the case of schooling, dramatically improved its access to education and was one of the fastest risers on the PISA scale. Uh, Peru, another country, Colombia, Vietnam, the most obvious case, perhaps, you know, uh, Vietnam, the 10% of the most disadvantaged students in Vietnam can now compare their math skills with the average students in the UK. You know, I mean, enormous success in expanding quantity and quality. China, you know, they, our picture is still more patchy, but you can see big improvements in quantity. There are other countries where there has been a quality, quantity trade-off, where expansion has met, you know, declining outcomes or flatlining outcomes. But I do think it makes me optimistic that, you know, we can square the quality equity picture. Good. Thank you. Um, now I'll go to the floor for one, perhaps starting on my left, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Anand Shukla. I've got a question for Andreas actually on the um, early years data that you presented um, just before the coffee break. Um, I'd just be interested to find out what it includes uh, in terms of, does, so will it include the spending that we have in the UK, for example, through tax credits on childcare? Does it include the spending on reception classes? Um, I saw that um, the data, I think, went up to 2014, so obviously it won't include things like the 30 hours of spend that has gone in. I mean, my point is that um, I suspect that the UK is, is a bit close to the middle of that income distribution on spend rather than towards the bottom. But I, I'd just be interested to know what the data includes. Um, actually, we would include tax credits. We would in basically include all money that somehow ends up in an institution. What we do not include is, you know, family organized care and sort of informal forms, which in the United States would increase spending. Uh, I don't think the relative rate is standing of Britain would change that much because we'd actually do the same in all countries. Uh, what you're right is we do not yet account for the 15 to 30 hour increase. That may change the picture in in, in it years to come. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Ellie, could I ask you just to pick up on that particular point? Um, we saw a lot of wide variation in <coughs> enrollment rates in early years, um, particularly up to the age three, and vast differences in the proportion of spending on it that is from private and public sources. Um, does, does that variation from the UK's perspective concern you? Does it matter how much of the spending is public and how much is private and how much is rooted through institutions and how much is things like tax credits? Does it matter? Um, I think to a certain extent, yes, it does because the amount that is coming from public spending sends a message from the government about how much they value um, early years education and how much they're willing to make sure that all children, regardless of how much their parents earn and therefore how much their parents can pay, are deserving of a high quality early years education. Um, and I think, it, with specific reference to the 33 um, hours, that one might argue that the government is trying to send a message that it does matter and that they are willing to put the money in because they're willing to make sure that all children get that amount. Um, but I think then in reality, the major issues that the, we've seen in the funding of that actual policy um, means that perhaps there is, is not as much behind that as we would like to see. Um, quite often nurseries are finding that they are not being funded by the government for 33 hours with the same amount of money that a parent would have to pay to access that before the policy came into place. And because that policy was um, created in order to get labour market outcomes in terms of moving mothers into work, then there hasn't been a focus on quality. Whereas I personally would feel that if you focused on quality and putting money in to improve the quality of early years education for all of the reasons that Andreas has already touched upon in terms of how important it is, then yes, you would see the labour market outcomes because women would think, there's a great nursery, the government are putting money into it, my child can go there and now I can go off to work. Whereas when you lead with the labour market, um, desire, you know, the desire to improve, to improve the number of women in work, to increase the number of women in work, and not with the quality, and then you underfund it, then, then it does matter that they're doing, that that's where the money is coming from, and people are having to top that up. Okay, interesting, thank you. Um, should we take another question? Just to, maybe one addition, you know, I think also, you know, you've tied uh, the 30 hours to employment, which has sort of its reasons, but actually it would probably be done, you know, for, for the sake of education, done a better job in tying it to disadvantage. You know, now you're excluding actually women or uh, children from families where there's no employment, who may be actually the most vulnerable ones, 
whereas actually ensuring that it's the least, the most vulnerable ones to get the 30 hours rather than employment might have done a better job in improving equity of all them. Vanessa? I think that's right. I think you know, there's been really extensive research uh, over a number of years about um, how disadvantage starts at a very, very early age. So you know, hence the policy of uh, <coughs> Sure Start and Children's Centres that Gordon Brown introduced. And I think that, um, Andreas, uh, your point earlier uh, in, in your speech about you know, the system and the outcomes cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. If you invest in early years education in high quality teaching, then the outcomes will be high quality. So I think, you know, you know, the, I think that the statistics really speak for themselves in relation to this. And I guess coming back to Andreas, do you get the sense from governments around the world that they understand these issues or how much are those differences are actually about differences in the labour market. So we heard earlier about um, the Japanese labour market um, for women is particularly unique. Um, I'd imagine that also may drive some of the demand for childcare services. Um, how far across the world are governments becoming more aware of the educational aspects of these things? Well, actually, the numbers speak for themselves. You look at the global trend, the huge investment that governments have made across countries actually is evidence of the growing value that early learning has. They also, you know, look at staff qualifications. Ten years ago, you know, you had very patchy kind of provision, very poorly paid people, and so on. That has changed. I think in most OECD countries, you know, now have, you know, decent access, improving quality. Basically, we are building the same kind of systems that we take for granted in primary education. You know, there's absolutely no reason for us to sort of think that you know, when, when, when young people become five years old, suddenly everything changes in their lives. You know, we should take those kinds of services for granted, particularly for the smallest and most vulnerable children. And I actually think governments have listened in the sense that you, know, you see more money, you see better quality, and uh, I think that's a good, good story overall. Um, we have a question over that way, please. Hi, Sue Gray from the uh, Institute of Education, UCL. Andreas, I wonder if you could say something about the international early learning study that you're about to pilot. Yeah, you know, one of the, uh, one of the big gaps in our evidence base is that we know very little about the social, emotional, and cognitive development of children in early childhood education and care. We know very little about it because we don't have direct measures of those outcomes. We have not even indirect measures of staff qualifications and preparation. You know, we know very little about what happens in early childhood education and care. And what we're trying to do at the OECD is to build a framework for this, to build metrics that actually measure the social, emotional, and cognitive development of five-year-olds. And over time, that should give us at least a, some measure on, on what children actually experience. Um, I forgot to say, Andreas has to leave us shortly for um, another important engagement. So um, if I could ask if the next question uh, is one for Andreas in particular, if you could make sense of me. So one on my left here. So, from early years to lifelong learning, Andreas, mm. and we think that as a charity, much too much focus on the education system, yet we've got roughly half our adult population, working age population, working at the equivalent of primary school levels. So I was wondering whether you had experience from your work globally of where governments have been able to use touch points with a citizen or employers use touch points with their employees to engage uh, their individuals in, in learning and progression. You know, I said before, in the case of early learning, I do think governments have got the message, citizens have got the message, and a lot is happening. When I look at lifelong, life-wide learning, I don't think anybody has got that message. I don't think individuals take the responsibility for their own learning. I don't think governments take their responsibilities. And most importantly, institutions not. You know, if you actually want to learn, you have the money to learn, try to go to a university and say, well, recognize my skills and take me where I am and bring me where I want to go. They will tell you, no, we only provide these degrees, big, lumpy kind of qualifications. I think all of those areas are ones where I think we do a very, very poor job. And you know, if you look to the future, the more accelerating, we live in this age of accelerations where change is everywhere and where the capacity and the willingness of people to you know, upgrade themselves, to invest in themselves is becoming so important. And the opportunities for that are simply poor and the participation rates are poor. We have this very lopsided, front-sided, qualifications-focused education instead of the kind of lifelong, life-wide 
skills-oriented learning. Now, which countryside fund was your question? I think Sweden is doing really well, Norway. What they have done is several things. First of all, they make provision accessible. They have made provision modular. So higher education is a much more granular kind of activity. <laughs> Their employers are willing to share time. You know, if as an adult you want to study while working, it's actually quite easy to do in Sweden because, you know, the way taxes, employers, the, the, the social systems are very much geared to that. Uh, individuals see the benefits because, because of the granularity of the qualification systems that translates into better earnings. Now, that's something which unions have really successfully negotiated there. Uh, I think that's, uh, that those are very few examples. And even there, you know, the investment of people over the life cycle is pretty low. The areas where you see that best is when you look at technology skills. You know, once we measure digital problem solving skills of workers, and it's simply amazing the gap between, you know, the 16 to 24 year old age cohort and the 50 to 60 age cohort. And that is something that, you know, it's just going to amplify. You know, what we're seeing today is going to what we're seeing tomorrow. So I think this is an area where we have been totally blind, but also individuals. You know, when you actually look at, I showed you some data here on adult learning, where the UK came out not so bad. No? But who goes? <laughs> it's typically those who have already university degrees. And those who need it most get the least of that kind of lifelong learning. So I think there's so many factors that we really need to look at. Martin. I think I'll pick up the first point that Andreas indicates that we didn't come out too bad. I, always the form at the education at a glance is a t moment in time and being set in 2015 was immediately before a 25 percent cut in adult education funding for that which is not at universities so i suggest that the next time around might see some really significant reductions here in terms of adult education within this country there already is not captured in the the report either is the reduction in part-time higher education uh, within the United Kingdom and also the significant underrepresentation of short cycle higher education compared to other European nations which is a, essentially the modular type of education you're, you're talking about. There may be some, some might say there'll be some redressing in that in terms of apprenticeships for older workers but by its very definition an apprenticeship is somebody who's in work. So it's not education for those not in work or about seeking to approach the, the, the job market or looking to change their form of occupation. So I do think we have a looming crisis around adult, ed adult education that is not university based. Uh, and I think also that uh, government begin is beginning to recognize this. But most of the representations I've seen in the skills plan and the like seem to me <laughs> sketchy. And that's a, a, a generous description of the design here. So I think there's a recognition of the problem, but no strong conception of what the, the, the solution might be. Uh, um, Andreas, th thank you for that. The question that I wanted to ask with regards to the research that you've conducted is to do with the SDGs and the 2030 target that we're heading towards. And you take stock of where <laughs> governments are, at least the OECD mm -hmm. member countries. Um, the question I really wanted to ask was, uh, in, from your experience of working with governments around the world, who is best preparing for 2030? Not in just in, in terms of the SDGs, but in terms of what future society will look like and where we're going uh, in terms of our education systems. That's a, that's a really tough question. I mean, in terms of the SDGs on, on quantity, I think most countries are getting there. Uh, in terms of among the industrialized countries, I can only talk mm. really about. Uh, in terms of quality, the picture remains very patchy and the big shift from the Millennium Development Goals to the SDGs was, you know, quality. relevance, quality. I think there's a very kind of patchy picture. There's a very unequitable uh, <coughs> picture on this. But then your question went further, you know, it's about in 21st century, you know, who's going to, you know, prepare for digital learning for the age where, you know, it's about complementing artificial intelligence with the human qualities that's going to make a difference. Countries like Singapore are very much forward-looking in that respect. Uh, if you look at uh, the attention, these Singapore, actually, I would generally say Asia is more awake on the big shift and changes that are coming than, than Europe and uh, North America. We are ma very much market-oriented. We look at the skill demand out there today. We ask employers, you know, what skills they need, and we look at differences. 
What you see in uh, Asia is a more strategic perspectives. You know, they look much further out in the future. You know, what do I need to do, teach the primary school children today in order to equip them with the, this greater emphasis, for example, on character qualities, on social emotional skills in those, in a country like Singapore, Japan, China, than you would find here. I think they're more kind of strategic acting on, on this. But still, you know, if you ask me, at least judging from today's data, the gap between what societies are looking for and what education provides is becoming wider, not smaller. Despite all of the progress you see on the screen, I think our, the, skill, the demand picture works faster than supply picture. Why do I say this? Look at the growing earnings gap. That's just a mirror of this, the employment gap, the social penalties. One of the figures someone asked me about this, you know, look at depression, you look at social outcomes, and all of those things are amplifying. Thank you very much. I'm afraid uh, I've been informed we need to lose Andreas now. So, uh, <laughs> and Andreas, thank you very much for your um, excellent answers and incredibly insightful, uh, insightful presentation earlier. Thank you. <laughs> okay, are there further questions? Hello, lady just down here. I wanted to ask this when Andreas is here, but uh, never mind. I'm sure the other panel members can answer fine. One of the things he touched upon was the rather depressing data that we still aren't very good in this country and in terms of manufacturing and the vocational side. We've stayed lumbering around the bottom or somewhere near the bottom. And also there is this whole issue of gender differences, mm -hmm. particularly in those areas of STEM and manufacturing. And I wondered uh, what the panel, uh, would they comment on this and whether we think we can do anything about it? Because it's something that a huge number of organizations have tried to do and really have many initiatives. Why can we really, really not crack this in terms of vocational and man manufacturing? Um, Martin, have you got a view on this? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. One of the questions you might have asked from Andreas's presentation was actually if the graduate earning premium is holding up so well, what's the problem with everyone 50% or better of the population doing a degree? Well, the problem is that the skills accrued don't necessarily fall within those sectors of the economy that are most important to productivity and growth, and to some lesser extent, but significant, I think, social equity. So actually, the choices that young people make and the courses that are available to them become very important. Therefore, the point within the report which identifies that funding in this country for vocational programs is significantly less than general programs tends to reinforce the presumption that everyone here should follow an academic course through the course of their life and now that would lead them to a more prosperous future. Now to some degree the data backs that up but in key areas of the economy like construction, engineering and some aspects of science it does not. Uh, so the choices and the introductions that young people receive in the age range 16 to 18 I think become extraordinarily important within this. So I think the report actually in, in that regard is an indictment of previous government policies, but I would actually say an endorsement of future intent of government policy and direction of travel around T-levels and around technical education. But what, sorry, I've gone too long on this, Peter, but what the report also misses slightly in terms of its categorization, where it compares the level of investment in post-secondary, is that post-secondary within the OECD definition is 15 to 18. We have a particular problem in this country with funding for education is 16 to 18, which is not captured within the report because it's buttressed by the, the wider age group of 15. Uh, the 16 to 18 education here suffers a 22% reduction compared to 11 to 16. It has roughly 50% of the teaching hours devoted to 16 to 18 to education compared to Norway, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands and France. If that's the case, preparation for young people to make informed and effective choices at 18 in order to follow those areas of activity affected both by funding, class prejudice, 
previous history, signalling, as Mike talked about, from a range of issues. So I think we have a problem in terms of the types of programmes people choose at 15 to 18, the types of the level of funding that's accorded to them, which I think government recognises, the Sainsbury report talks much about. But as the Sainsbury report has said, this is a 100-year problem with the United Kingdom. And if you're going to fix it, it's going to take at least 10 years to fix it, not be fixed by one report and two years' worth of action. Vicar? Uh, Vicar, uh, and then Vanessa. Hi. Um, one of the things that we should also look at, and there's some uh, reports on this subject, and it was no different to when I was growing up, actually. Um, and I apologize for colleagues who, uh, who I may comment on um, here. But there is this issue about a career service fit for purpose. And we know that, for example, we commissioned a, a report with the TES, actually, a survey of teachers. Um, and teachers said the, most, the thing that I think they would value the most is interaction with industry. Um, and that they, they, their perception was that that doesn't happen. And so we have to think in terms of the connect between industry, especially in the manufacturing and engineering side of things, uh, with schools and school leaders more effectively. And I know, and I know that there are se several initiatives and organization, uh, organizations set up for that, but we ought to think in terms of, well, what does a career service fit for the 21st century actually look like, uh, given the massive disruption that people predict is coming our way? Vanessa. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the biggest areas for uh, growth and development in the education sector uh, at the moment, uh, or needs to be, um, because there has been a complete lack of parity uh, between qualifications and the focus on qualifications that lead to more traditional academic routes of study than there has been in terms of investment in qualifications uh, for vocational. But really are practically implementable and also speak to the needs of industry as well as the needs of young people. And the, one of the biggest gaps for me uh, in the provision of education over my time uh, in, in, in education has been the gap between education and employers. Um, and, and, and that's left us with a sort of vacuum of the relationship between what school students experience uh, in their schooling and then what they go into in the workplace. Um, some organisations like KPMG and, and others have really uh, tried to uh, sponsor that and to really have some inroads into things like uh, apprenticeships. But until we have uh, a similar kind of emphasis on technical uh, education and the, the rigour, the intellectual rigour that needs to lie behind it, I was really privileged, it was quite formative for me, that early on in my headship I was able to go and visit some of the technical lycées in France, in Paris. And I went to um, a school uh, which was for the craft of stone masonry, um, construction and the upkeep of old buildings. And the level and quality of educational provision that I saw in those institutions, in particular, I remember a project where um, a, a group of students went to Notre Dame and then produced an exact replica of a spiral stone staircase in miniature. And the, 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 the range of skills and intellectual thinking that stood behind that um, isn't reflected really anywhere in the qualification system for um, and teaching for vocational and technical learning in this country. And given that the OECD report points out uh, that where uh, education is really successful in relation to information technology and engineering and manufacturing, it's when there is this very close link between upper secondary education um, and those sectors. Um, we have to find a way in this country of providing for that field. It's not a secondary modern uh, um, second best option. And it never should be, and it never should have been in the first place. It needs to have actual uh, uh, equal um, um, emphasis in, in our system, Peter, I think. Can I make you just a, a very quick clarification? Because I feel extraordinarily strongly about this. Parity of esteem is something to be uh, sought and extraordinarily important. I think you make a very good point. Parity of esteem must not come from, though, seeking parity to be the same. The no, means by which those true. students that's in true. France will have been examined in their work and the quality of their learning would not have been by a written essay mm -hmm. nor by a timed exam. It would yeah. have been in terms of judging their competence, their capability and by observation. That's an expensive business, which is what Andrew's point I think made very well. 
in most countries, vocational education and technical education is seen as being more expensive to deliver. In this country, we see it as cheaper to deliver and for other people's children. But as long as we can carry on seeing those terms, we'll come up with the same result. I agree with you. Yeah. Could I, um, Thank you. I'll phrase on, on um, sort of contribution to this as a question to you, Martin, because I'm loath, loath to disagree with you and your expert area. Um, but in terms of you know, the, how we had the question phrased to us in preparation for this panel, as whether or not we would be concerned about the low proportion of um, young people or indeed old people going, having um, vocational qualifications. Whereas I think what, what we are talking about being more concerned about, and I completely agree with, is the quality of it and how it is measured against an academic route and seen as an instead of because you can't do that, so you better do that instead. But would you be concerned about the proportion? Because is there not an argument to think if we are moving towards, you know, let's talk about a knowledge economy and in, you know, a future where 3D printers will manufacture things for us, that perhaps it's okay, do you think, to have more people moving towards an academic um, qualification, if that is indeed right for them, and therefore we're more concerned about quality rather than proportion of people in vocational education, or are you concerned about proportion as well? I'm concerned about proportion as well. If you put a target on 50% of young people must be do technical education T-levels, that will be the death of it. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be seen as a high quality route demanding of talented people, then I think actually it looks about no more than 30% of the cohort. So um, proportion is not right quality is first to hold up in, in this regard. And I think also the other word that's much overlooked in terms of the term technical education is the education word. Mm. So actually, particularly for young people, there's a range of facilities <laughs> and capabilities you seek to develop, as well as developing the straight knowledge of their subject and the understanding of their ability to do the job, which allows them to, to find other routes forward later in their life. So understanding the educative, broad educative, as well as the technical elements of the program will be important and I think it needs to be built in a way in which is aspirational to be in it. Now that there needs to be routes into it for those that need perhaps more time to prepare themselves to access a T level. But I am absolutely with you. If if we build it for fifty percent it becomes a subject to I know there was a manifesto of the last Labour uh, or the, for the the election before last. If it's vocational was for the other fifty percent you're inevitably going to make it for those the 50% that can't do academic. Yeah, By its own right. definition, you, you can sign people to a, a way of looking at it. So yeah. I think it must be quality, it must be rigorous, but rigorous in its own terms. Can I, can I just jump in to make one point that um, in those stats you saw, those um, fabulous returns to tertiary education from across the world, um, in our context, that's the bulk of those people are doing three of bachelor's degrees and so on. In many other countries, a big chunk of those people with those fabulous returns are actually doing vocationally orientated, um, more business links degrees as well. So in those examples, there is a bit more of an endpoint to the vocational route, which is a high level of education and which does generate those sorts of returns. And that's why you know, in all countries, you've got a gap between the, high, the most advantaged and least, dis least advantaged in tertiary entry rates. But in Germany, actually, even the most advantaged people um, are only as likely to attain uh, tertiary level education as the least advantaged in Singapore, if I've got that right. Um, so the whole structure th through levels is different. What we're talking about, though, is, is an education you know, system that is fit for individuals. It's individualised as well as the needs of, of society and the economy, isn't it? And the whole point about lifelong learning as well. And that, uh, that, that rounded um, picture of what happens for young people in their earliest years and what happens with adults and, and seeing it as a, a much more holistic, uh, needs-based uh, system rather than a very traditional divided system, um, which I don't think, if it ever worked, it doesn't work any longer. Thank you. Um, any further questions on perhaps other topics? Will? Thank you. Um, Will from LKM Co. Um, what do we know about, how, um, about access into tertiary education for young people with forms of special educational need and disability? And can we be optimistic? Uh, Vanessa, is it something you've covered much on? Well, I think going back to the point that I just made about needs and, and needs being, um, you know, about the whole, the whole person as, as, as well as their academic and uh, vocational uh, needs. Um, I think one of the things that um, has been uh, really um, 
emphasised recently, are the needs of the special needs of young people around their mental health, for example. We've had significant funding cuts uh, to uh, services that support those needs. Not just those needs, but other needs uh, of children with special educational needs. So, um, so I mean, as far as um, you know, as, as, as far as our, our, our provision, you know, needs to, to be in, in terms of the schools that, uh, that we run in the Mulberry Schools Trust, it's about how we ensure that uh, within the group of schools that we have, uh, we make provision for those most vulnerable students by multi-agency care and work that, uh, that we source through the agencies that still exist following the cuts. Um, and then also how we think about alternative provision and the funding needs for alternative provision because it is more expensive. Um, but if we're going to have a, a society which uh, includes all children and doesn't leave them out, then it's, it's something that uh, we have to um, think very carefully about also in relation to the academic and vocational provision that we're, uh, we're making. So one of the things that we're doing this week um, is looking at uh, our relationship with um, our special needs, a local special needs boys school, for example and the University Technical College that we're opening and the uh, provision that can be made between the two. So having those innovative partnerships will also help. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that some of those children will be left behind unless we address the funding needs. Um, I think in answer to the end bit of your question, Will, there, there is reason to be optimistic, um, at least to a certain extent. I think, um, as we talked about yesterday, the um, expansion of the code of practice to include sort of you know from from zero to twenty five years of age, um, from bringing bring that up from up to from nineteen years of age, um, means that people are going to be encouraged to look more at the progression of their special educational needs and pupils with disabilities, um, and therefore you know we have hope that perhaps if where people are um, doing that well, that may allow some of those pupils to go on to tertiary education. Um, and it encourages people to sort of think about their journey through our education system more holistically with outcomes really in mind. Um, but I think it still remains to be seen whether that means that people are providing what those pupils need to actually make that, um, that step. And I think there is some good practice from universities in looking at how they can create access for pupils with special educational needs and disabilities. But there's always more to be done and there's always not enough people talking about it. So, and If I can add just one bit. Special education needs is an extraordinarily wide definition and as the point was made it needs to be individualised to, to individuals or groups of individuals and sorts of provision. I only went one plea out I think is that's for specialist colleges, some of which are national and attending to particular disabilities or, or special needs in education. They find themselves quite difficultly placed around the devolution agenda with funds being sent to individual combined authorities who might be seeking to actually provide provision within their combined authority areas, which might be entirely the right thing to be doing for some young people, for, for yet some other young people going away to a specialist college at a partic particular 16 to 18 phase is an important thing to do. And uh, getting that balance back into the funding, it's not, not just about the quantum, there's the mechanics around this. Yeah. It, it's an extraordinarily complicated area of funding and I think I'm tending to the view that you, know, you, you either have to have a complex system which is, has the potential to be fair, rather than seeking a simple system which actually inherently will be unfair. So this is an issue that I, I think is, is not very well covered with the statistics in education at a glance, and I think that's because it's always a, dif a difficult issue to define in numerical terms. But I wondered if, um, Vika, you've got any perspectives internationally about whether there are some countries doing, um, providing um, better than others for those with special educational needs? It is an issue that we find that largely is ignored, actually. Uh, when, you, when you speak to system leaders, when we talk to public policy professionals, when you speak to ministers of education, I think what you find in the, in the world generally, I say, is, of course, it's important, um, but there are no practical solutions that they're coming forward with in terms of policy solutions to these issues. You know, our focus entirely is to do with the most marginalised societies. Um, and so speaking in London uh, at the OECD and at the launch of an OECD report is somewhat, um, you know, opposite to what we normally do. Uh, but we have to think of it in that context, I think. <coughs> so it could be something for more inclusion in future editions of the Education at Glance report. Um, any further questions from the floor? 
Um, I think we've got time for another, uh, which I'm going to pose. Um, I wonder if, if any of the panel have got particularly strong views on what we heard about, about teachers there. And I mean, two things from the UK's perspective leapt out there. One is, one is that the, the, the low average age of our teachers, particularly in primary schools, um, and although they're fairly um, similar to many other teachers around the world and not being as well paid as their um, tertiary educated peers, um, but nonetheless that the pay for them is falling quite rapidly compared to others. Um, Vika, do you have any strong views about this? Yeah, um, so our foundation is focused primarily on teachers and the capacity building of the teacher profession. Um, the thing that I want to do first is to step backwards and look at it from a macro basis. Um, when we talk about the sustainable development goals, which are, you know, the target is by 2030 that every child learns well, there's relevancy and all those good things. Um, there's a simple fact that people misunderstand in, when it comes to achieving these, which is an investment in your personnel or your workforce system uh, that is required. If you take in terms of, you know, we can talk about the teacher crisis or the challenges that Jonathan tells me uh, that the government prefers to reference. Um, you know, there are something like 69 million new teachers that are required between now and 2030 uh, to meet the SDGs. I'll repeat, 69 million. Where are we going to get them from, right? We really have to address these questions. Um, it's okay giving, you know, uh, your, your high-level statements. It's okay going to education events at the UN. It's okay speaking to governments about all of these things. But the fundamental question you need to answer is how are you going to recruit and retrain, uh, retain teachers? I think that's what our foundation has been focused on over the last few years, and we continue to do so. We have to look at, actually, why do people become teachers? And in the industrialized world, it is very much about making that difference, we find. People want to give back. You know, we see ourselves growing global citizens uh, and, and, and those kind of motivations. In the developing world, where primarily where our work is based, it is about having a steady job and having an income. And we have to think in terms of you know, uh, these 69 million teachers, they're mostly re uh, required in sub-Saharan Africa um, and in parts of Asia. And if that is a requirement, we've got to think in terms of how uh, political systems uh, address that challenge, uh, because, because there are significant issues to overcome. Um, but the fundamental question we see uh, amongst all of this, and Andrea speaks about uh, remuneration, he talks about making it intellectually more demanding. Um, actually, there's a, there's a broader question again, which is to do with the status of teachers. You know, how do we perceive teachers and the teaching workforce? And you know, um, you know, if I was to ask my kids, uh, what would you li like to become? Forget that they're Indian. They would say doctors, engineers, uh, accountants, uh, and those kind of professions, and not teachers. And we have to address that. So in 2013, uh, one of the first pieces of research we conducted was a, was a 21 country study on the issue of status uh, called the Global Teacher Status Index. And we're, we're going to do it again next year uh, and take a similar amount of countries. And what we found was only in China are teachers seen in the same regard as doctors. Everywhere else is a middle to low-ranking social status profession. You have to think about that. You really have to address that. And in the UK, we found that only 10% of parents or 10% of the general population would say that they would definitely encourage their children to, to pursue the teaching profession. Now, that has more to do with just remuneration. It's we have to address you know, how we're going to boost the stock of teachers in, in the common narrative. And initiatives like ours, like the Global Teacher Prize, uh, and so and those kind of initiatives, we think will take it a little bit further. But we really need to address that fundamental question first and foremost. Thank you. Um, any final questions before we wrap up? Um, just one more. Can I just ask you a question about mm, that? Sure. I think it's so important what you're, what you're saying, actually. It's about status. It is about money, but it's also about sure. status. And I mean, I just recently have had an eye operation. And the last thing I would want in my eye operation is someone who's just sort of not really very well qualified and just doing the job because somebody's got to step in. Now, this happens in teaching. People who aren't very well qualified will teach. And I just think it's somehow that's linked to the status. I mean, if you're going to be an eye surgeon, you have a very high status. Yeah. And jolly well, you are very well qualified. And I think it's these all things are mixed up. And OK, I hope my eye surgeon was also well paid. He did a jolly good job, by the way. But I just think it's all mixed up mm -hmm. that somehow or other, we don't think that yeah. teaching needs a really high quality and high uh, good skills. And I, I think it's so wrong. And it's at every level of our education system. 
So in Uganda, where we do a lot of our work, 10% of the primary teaching workforce have gone through our training programs, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty significant. And what we find over there, for example, is teachers, those that become teachers are, are those that have barely finished their secondary education. And you, have, uh, you can imagine the impact of that uh, in terms of when you're trying to educate the next generation. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about leap, uh, you know, developing countries having an opportunity to leapfrog, um, how is that going to be possible if you don't have the right caliber of, of personnel as well um, and the right levels of training uh, with regards to the teaching workforce? You're absolutely correct. Well, so, you know, I sort of hesitate to make another kind of FE point, but there is an outlier group in terms of the age profile of teachers in this country. Further education lecturers yeah. are becoming aging, it's an aging population. And there are two reasons for that. One is that to become a further education lecturer, and this is an international point, we do reasonably well in our country around further education teachers in the fact that they are dual professionals. They're recruited from the industry in which they've worked, and then they're trained then to be teachers. So they bring into the, work, into the workplace, into the teaching space, their experience from the workplace. Now that's counter-cyclical. At the very point at which you wish to increase the amount of technical education you're providing, because there's more construction going on, those lecturers become more attractive to go back into their preceding profession and trade rather than being in teaching. So there's always a pressure in terms of the younger members of staff leaving, which leaves those who are in teaching for a longer time. They tend to be less up to date than their, their cohort, that the younger cohort goes out to seek a job back in construction or in engineering. And the final point is because of the underfunding of further education colleges, wage reductions amongst further education staff has been, have been greater than any other sector, so they've fallen more quickly. Uh, so I think the point at which government wants to kick off more higher and better technical and professional education, they're going to face a staffing crisis born out of the economic cycle and the funding for that, that level of education. Thank you. Just quickly, Vanessa, and then we'll have to wrap I up. I just want to say as well, I mean, I know there are uh, uh, issues, and Andreas talked about them. I mean, I think teaching is one of the best jobs in the world. I mean, I would say that I'm a head teacher, and I've been in the profession for a long time. And I do think that, um, you know, the intellectually um, stimulating profession that we have uh, in this country uh, for uh, teachers uh, to really work together and to uh, to develop um, their professional expertise in the way that Andres was talking about that uh, we do in Japan. There are some things that we need to perhaps think about, I think, in our system and rethink what it means to be excited intellectually about what we're doing together in the classroom. Um, there are so many things that are about recognition and about value that we need to add to the teaching profession as well and the way that we talk about teachers. And so what I wanted to do is to end this session really with a plea actually that, you know, there are issues but actually teaching is one of the most fantastic jobs. Um, and it would be fantastic if um, we take lessons from what's been uh, um, said today from Andreas's report Great. for that. Thank you very much. Um, so that uh, unfortunately comes the end of our session. Uh, I found that really useful. I hope you have too. Um, so many thanks to the OECD for allowing us to um, host the launch of this report and to KPMG for supporting us with the, the venue and today's lovely event. Um, and a big thanks to our panellists and earlier speakers too.